Okrima Media's Polity Yamtabi Shomolikai, award-winning journalist Nicholas Barra, joins me today to unpack his latest publication, South Africa's Easy Election Guide, Who to Vote For in 2024. With the country's upcoming elections being said to be a turning point in South Africa's democratic journey and high stakes paved the way for mis- and disinformation, are you hoping to empower and inform registered and potential voters with this guide? Thank you very much for the opportunity, Tabi. Uh, yes, year 2024 is a critical year in South Africa's democracy. I know the, the age-old saying is that this is the most important election uh, in our democratic history. It certainly is the most important election since the last election. Uh, and this easy-to-follow guide is my attempt at trying to make it as easy as possible for voters to choose a political party come election day because we are seeing a downward trend in uh, voter turnouts. That's not only from the perspective of people that are actually registered coming out to vote. Uh, the graph is is just pointing downwards. You saw there was a bit of a bump from 1994 into 1999 um, with about 85% voter turnout. And then that regresses to just over 65% in 2019. But the most alarming part of that is if you look at the overall number uh, in comparison to actual people that are eligible to vote uh, and the actual turnout on, on uh, election day, less than 50% of the people that are eligible to vote in South Africa are actually turning out on election day after having registered. So I firmly believe that uh, a failed state, the road towards it, uh, is paved with voter apathy. And if we don't arrest that situation very soon in South Africa, we're are going to be faced with a situation where less and less people are voting and there's less and less buy-in to the democratic system. So this election guide is really just my attempt at trying to make it as easy as possible for voters to turn up on election day, have a political party that they believe uh, represents them, um, and uh, really just trying to get those numbers up uh, in terms of the amount of people that are uh, not only registered, but also the number of people that are actually coming out and voting as well. And how could citizens find the inspiration to vote? And do you have any advice for them? So uh, my book doesn't focus on the registration process. What my book does is essentially looks at 14 issues in South African society, uh, primarily you know, first, first being job creation and economic growth. That's critical. We live in the most uh, unequal society on earth. We've got the highest sustained rate of unemployment in the world. Um, and really, if we don't try and sort that out as a matter of absolute urgency, uh, we're on the road to chaos and uh, and consequence, really. Um, and then among those 14 issues, you've got your stock standard ones of safety and security, which is in, uh, encompasses police, defense, state security and the like, uh, your usual suspects of housing. Um, and of course, also youth development being the other ticking time bomb in South Africa. Um, we've got over 60% youth unemployment, highest rate in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, if less people that are under the age of 35 uh, have an actual interest in a future in South Africa, well, then they're, they're far less to lose and the propensity to see something that we did uh, in July 2021, the July riots. Uh, that propensity just grows with uh, young people that are disengaged and and don't have any anything meaningful to to do. Um, other innovative ones that I've included is tourism and artificial intelligence. And then essentially what I've done is I've taken those 14 themes and I've asked 14 political parties, ones that are already represented in the National Assembly and ones that are polling uh, to to enter. Um, I've asked them their standpoint on that, and, and that's essentially what this book is. It's a uh, hundred words or less on each of those themes by each of the political parties uh, that I interviewed uh, and put it into not only this book that's uh, got a thousand copies, courtesy of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the uh, foundation that paid for this book, and of course also the uh, University of Pretoria's Emerging Scholar Initiative, which printed the 1,000 copies. It's available as a, a free-to-download ebook as well. Uh, Tabi, and it's really just my attempt at trying to make it as easy as possible, like I've said, for voters to find someone that's relevant, that they believe can they, you know, that they can live with for the next five years in terms of uh, having voted for them and representing them in the, in the National Assembly and getting people out to vote. The ANC's support has slowly waned over the years amid criticism 
that it has failed to provide basic services and easy poverty for millions of the country's black majority. Uh, widespread corruption in state-owned institutions and in local and national government has further eroded its popularity. So do you think the ANC stands any chance of winning this year's elections? I mean, there have been predictions already that it will not win an outright majority. Well, uh, this book isn't about giving a projection on how each party will do. And I mean, I don't really like to enter into the realm of speculation. I'm uh, not a qualified pollster. Um, but what I will say is that, yes, you know, even the ANC's own polling is showing that it's going to drop below 50 percent for the first time in democratic uh, history. Really, I think the magic number there is, is around 45, 46 percent. If you see the ANC dropping below that. Uh, then they won't be able to form a coalition with uh, smaller parties, maybe the likes of the Patriotic Alliance, which is already governing with the ANC in various councils around South Africa. Then they have to start looking at engaging the economic freedom fighters uh, for support in order to get across the 50% line. And then I think that, that uh, you know, the conversation changes then uh, in terms of what we can expect post the election in 2024. Um, the ANC governing with one or two smaller parties, maybe your Al Jamaa, Patriotic Alliance, um, and perhaps even the IFP in KwaZulu Natal is a completely different kettle of fish from the ANC needing to rely on Julius Malema's economic freedom fighters uh, to get into uh, national the National Assembly as a you know the head of a, a coalition government. Uh, the EFF has made no a secret of its demands. If it were to go into national government with the ANC, it would want to seek the the uh, nationalisation and redistribution of land. Um, also look at the, the nationalization of certain economic sectors of the economy. Uh, they've, of course, softened their approach on the overall wholesale nationalization of the banking system, but they definitely would push for the nationalization of the Reserve Bank. And, uh, you, you know, we don't actually know what's going to happen. It's a good three months away, three, four months away until election time. Election date hasn't been announced as of yet. And I think anybody who says conclusively the ANC is going to get X, Y or Z uh, is really just entering the realms of speculation, even though we are starting to see the polls come out uh, showing the ANC support waning. Uh, you need to remember, once the ANC electoral machine gets going, uh, you really do see people come out in their numbers and vote for uh, not only the, the oldest liberation movement in South Africa, but indeed the oldest political party on the African continent. Uh, the ANC's electoral machine is something to behold once it does get going. But it remains to be seen whether or not they'll they'll be able to um, to, to have a strong showing at the polls, Tabby. Talking about the economic freedom fighters, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation survey in December showed that there is growing support for the EFF. However, there are questions surrounding its prospects for success, particularly given the party's far-left positions and disruptive tactics. Briefly tell us more about what the party advocates for. Um, well, I don't want to give completely everything away uh, in terms of uh, the content for the book for each, polit uh, each particular political party. Um, but what I will say is that the EFF's economic approach has not changed. Far more state intervention, um, pursuing of, of socialist policies in the, uh, the, uh, you're in the way of aggressive land reform, uh, nationalization of certain sectors of the economy. Uh, and also what I thought is very innovative from the FF is that they're really one of only about two or three parties that have taken artificial intelligence seriously and really put the idea that South Africa is facing uh, a revolution of digitization and, and are we are what opportunities and challenges that presents to the South African economy. The Economic Freedom Fighters is one of a handful that's actually articulated policy on that, uh, looking for uh, much more affordable data. Uh, much more um, uh, of a focus at a tertiary education level uh, when it comes to uh, digital technology. Um, and also, you know, looking in, uh, away from artificial intelligence uh, as part of their, their policies, they also want to try and make it illegal for a house to be repossessed if it's been paid for for more than five years by a bondholder. Um, also try and create more opportunities for people that uh, had their livelihoods challenged or taken away during COVID. So the economic freedom fighters, it's all there in black and white in the book, and I'm not going to go into deep details now, but, uh, you know, nothing unorthodox from an EFF point of view. They still want a lot of state intervention. They want to introduce socialist policies at a high level if they were um, the, you know, the national government in South Africa. 
But once again, we have to remind ourselves, even if they are a coalition partner to the ANC, coalitions are about everybody giving away some space and not getting what they want uh, in its entirety. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of other opposition part parties, primarily the DA, is, is really using the EFF, the potential of EFF going into government as um, what I would regard as a scarecrow, which I think, you know, opposition parties are, are very guilty of negative campaigning, saying vote for us so you don't get them as opposed to saying, well, vote for us so we can do A, B, and C. While on the Democratic Alliance and coalition governance, the Democratic Alliance coalition governance record is also not as impressive as where they govern in majority. The party formed a multi-party pact ahead of elections to unseat the ANC. So do you think, looking at the policies of the DA, think that the DA will work well with other parties in the pact, particularly after it failed to make a sustained impact in Twani and in Johannesburg, where they have led various coalition governments? Well, you know, I focus a lot uh, on this exact point when talking about the DA in the book. Uh, each chapter on each political party, it starts off with a history and background, uh, recent electoral uh, record of, of each party that's included. Uh, and I make the point that the Democratic Alliance has done well in places that it governs outright. You're looking at George in the Western Cape, the uh, city of Cape Town Metro. Um, but you're indeed correct. You know, the uh, Johannesburg Metro, Tswane Metro, uh, the DA's governance record has left a lot to be desired there, really. And um, what do they have to show after uh, two different coalition governments in Johannesburg, one led by uh, Herman Mashaba and the other one by Dr. Mpo Palazzi? Um, and then also in Tswane as well, there, there's been a fair amount of instability um, in that metro, even though the DA has uh, a fairly lengthy governance record there. I mean, even before the recent 2021 um, local government elections, it, it did govern for part of the last term between 2016 and 2021. And it remains to be seen whether or not the DA will will, will be able to, to, to operate, uh, you know, as a equal partners, so to speak, uh, in a, a, a big coalition government like the Moonshot Pact that they're trying to, to, to put together. The DA has many occasions been accused of trying to act like a big brother uh, figure in a coalition government saying, well, at the end of the day, you are just here for us to make up the numbers. We lead this government and you need to fall into line. And I mean, that does make sense from a stability point of view. You don't want to continuously argue uh, the same points, uh, you know, umpteen times, but at the same, yeah, in the same breath, you you at least want uh, constituents of a uh, coalition government to feel as though that they are uh, being heard, that they are being taken seriously, and they're not just there to make up the numbers in uh, a DA show. And lastly, Nicholas, there are a number of newly formed political parties with no track record in government. So what must citizens look out for in such political parties? Well, you know, it's it's very easy for not only the first political parties that are fighting this election, Bold One South Africa, Musi Maimani's outfit being one of them. Another one that's also received a lot of coverage is Rise and Zanzi. And also don't, uh, don't, don't discount independent candidates in the form of Zaki Ahmed and the like, which consequently I was very disappointed that Zaki Ahmed decided not to take part in this book, saying that he... He doesn't want his um, his policy offering to be a box ticking exercise. He wants to be a voice of the people. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but look, I digress. I think that you know, smaller parties and also new parties have the benefit of putting forward policies that they that they know in their heart of hearts they're not going to be able to implement because uh, unless there's a massive shocking upset, uh, I don't see any of these new parties in the form of Bossa, Rice, and Zanzi, and smaller parties like the ACDP. Uh, even the Patriotic Alliance, I don't actually see them being able to implement these policy ideas at a national stage. So you need to, as a voter, as a reader of this book as well, uh, take what they're saying with a pinch of salt because, uh, you know, it's not as though a small party can wave a magical wand and, and be in national government. That takes a lot of, uh, of time, a lot of traction, a lot of playing the political game and canvassing on the ground. And well, we are seeing them being well received in communities, whether or not it's Bossa or Rise and Zanzi. You have to get very, very real about uh, what what you can expect. I mean, there's there's not one political party that has been able to to break past the eight percent mark in a first electoral showing 
um, when they've just been created. I'm thinking of the likes of the UDM. It scored less than 4% in 1999. Um, COPE in 2009, it scored less than 8%. Uh, and then, you know, we've also got the likes of the EFF as well in their first electoral showing in 2014. They got, I think, just over 6%. So we need to be very realistic. You know, there's politicians are full of bravado and, uh, and confidence on the campaign trail. Say, we will win this election. I think a, a much more uh, realistic and astute move would be to say, look, this is our policy offering. We are going to try and focus on these points should we be part of a coalition government. Uh, and this is what we would like to do in opposition. In their hearts of hearts, they know that they're not going to win the election. So why are they trying to convince voters that they are? Um, at the end of the day, I think the more real you are with voters, the more that they are going to to trust you and, and, and give you a chance. That was Nicholas Barrow speaking to Krima Media's policy about South Africa's easy election guide, who to vote for in 2024.